Peter, good to see you again. How are you? I'm well. How are you doing, Peter? I'm doing very good. I think it's uh, uh, quite good setting for this because I'm actually out in El Salvador at the moment, which is uh, relevant to the topic oh, of today. Oh, yeah. Poor El Salvador. About to get a lot poorer. You guys really <laughs> suckered, the, suckered El Salvador in. Well, we, we will see about that one. Uh, <laughs> uh, Greg Foss, my buddy up, uh, well, I saw you about a week ago, didn't I, in Boston. How are you? Um, well, thank you. Nice to meet you, uh, Peter Schiff, and thanks, uh, Peter McCormick, for uh, for having me. I'm a, I'm a Canadian, Peter Schiff. I'm a Canadian, but I'm in Maine right now. Oh, all right. Do you want to give Peter a little bit of your background uh, and your entry into Bitcoin so he understands a little bit about you? Because about you, you know Schiff. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Well, I started watching Peter in the late 90s uh, while I was working on the sell side of the street. I was a high-yield bond trader, Peter. Mm -hmm. I worked on the uh, sell side of the street for uh, about 15 years uh, for uh, TD Securities uh -huh. in both uh, ba on both Bay Street and Wall Street. Um, then I switched to uh, the buy side. I w worked at uh, two different hedge funds, um, particularly the second one over the great financial crisis, so credit-focused uh, hedge fund. And I found Bitcoin in uh, in 2016. I followed your uh, your advice on gold over a period of time. I followed your thoughts on Bitcoin, and I'm here to uh, take maybe the other side of the argument on a friendly basis. This is not going to be confrontational, I hope, but uh, we're all big boys in the room, so I look forward to our conversation. Well, listen, we're all, we're all fans of Peter Schiff. Uh, we've all learned a lot from you historically, uh, especially some of your analysis during the 2008 crisis. Also, I got to meet Spencer, by the way. I got to meet Spencer at the uh, Bitcoin conference in Miami. So I just wanted to commend you. You've raised a very smart young man there. He's an impressive guy. <laughs> Apparently not smart enough. <laughs> Hold on now, Peter. I sent him Bitcoin for his birthday, and he acknowledged my gift. And that's the time, the only time on Twitter that you've acknowledged my presence. You called me out and said, uh, "I'm a knucklehead for sending your son a birthday gift," but I still feel good about it. I think he's done. Uh, he's done okay. So I agree with Peter McCormick. He's a he's a great young man. And <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, look, P Peter. Last time we spoke was July 2020. Uh, gold was at $1,840 an ounce, and Bitcoin was at $9,500. Today's price is gold is $30 low, lower-ish, $1,800-ish, and Bitcoin's at $50,000, so it's a 425% increase. I know you don't think that matters. Uh, so the way I'm going to manage this is I I'm going to just do my best to moderate. Everyone knows my show's a Bitcoin show. I've got the Bitcoin version of your show, essentially. Uh, so I do have a bias, but I'm going to try to be as impartial as possible and just, moder just moderate the conversation. Uh, let's not, I'll try and avoid people talking over each other and give everyone a fair chance to, to answer. But I think a good, a good starting point is just to give each of you, you know, three, three, four minutes as you need to outline your case uh, uh, on, on the subject that matter today. And I'll let you go. I'll let you go first, Peter. Yeah. Well, first of all, you know, I don't think that price is really relevant to the discussion. I mean, sure, you know, Bitcoin has gone up more than gold during that time frame. It's gone up more than a lot of things. Uh, but that doesn't mean that Bitcoin, you know, in any way compares to those other assets that ha didn't have the same type of price appreciation. In fact, if price appreciation is your barometer, well then um, uh, Ethereum is way better than Bitcoin. I mean, since, you know, I, I, we met last, we're together, uh, Ethereum has gone up a lot more than Bitcoin. In fact, I think since Ethereum was first started six years ago, I think if you just sold all your Bitcoin and just put it all into Ether, you'd have more money today. So you can't just say, oh, whatever goes up the most is the best, or you're going to have to change the name of your podcast to what Ether did. And, and in fact, you know, I haven't really listened to the podcast. I always imagined it was a very short podcast because all you'd have to say is Bitcoin went up. Tune in again tomorrow. Right. I mean, that's what Bitcoin did. But one of these days it's going to stop going up and it's going to come down. And so will Ether. And so will, you know, there's almost 12,000 of these things now. I mean, you worry about inflation. Look at inflation in cryptocurrencies. I mean, they continue to come up with these uh, one after another. I mean, the supply is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And now it's not just cryptocurrencies. You got NFTs. You got all so kinds of worthless things that people are buying. And eventually, the supply of nothing is going to exceed the demand for nothing. 
You know, and eventually the people who are buying nothing are going to decide they want, they want something for their money. They don't want to just buy nothing. Uh, you know, although what they are buying is a pipe dream. They're buying the dream that they're going to get rich. And one of the reasons that that dream you know, is so appealing is that some people have already gotten rich based on the fact that Bitcoin is 50000 There are a lot of people that bought it at much lower prices who got rich selling it at these prices. Or some of them aren't even selling. They're just borrowing against their Bitcoin, uh, just the way people were borrowing against uh, you know, home equity during, during that bubble. I mean, that happens during a lot of bubbles. People don't want to sell. You know, they're afraid to sell because they're afraid of missing out on all the gains. But they want to spend some money. They don't want to be stuck in their, their parents' basement. You know, Bitcoin millionaires, but you know, don't even have their own place. But now they're able to go out and, and, and borrow some money uh, because they can loan out their Bitcoin, because there's demand for the Bitcoin right now, because there's so much speculative trading going on. But what isn't happening in Bitcoin is legitimate commerce. I mean, the people that came to me 10 years ago and told me that, hey, gold's no good because you can't buy coffee with, a cup of coffee with gold, but you can buy a cup of coffee with Bitcoin. No, you can't. You can't buy a cup of coffee with Bitcoin. In fact, it's probably easier to buy it with gold than with Bitcoin. Uh, but despite the fact that People aren't buying coffee with Bitcoin. They're speculating on it. They're trading it. I mean, they're collecting them. And yeah, the price is going up. Uh, but uh, eventually, the price is going to crash. You know, it's, I, I don't know exactly when, but I'm confident that that's what's going to happen. And a lot of people are going to be very disappointed uh, to see all those paper profits evaporate. Well, I agree with you. Price uh, appreciation alone uh, doesn't count. Did you, did you want to mention anything about gold at all? You didn't mention anything there. Well, I mean, look, I mean, the, the, the thing about gold and Bitcoin is Bitcoin pretends to be digital gold. I mean, that's part of the marketing spiel of Bitcoin that, hey, you know, Bitcoin is better than gold, but it's got nothing in common with gold. Gold is a commodity. Gold is a metal. Uh, Bitcoin is neither. I mean, Bitcoin is just a digital token. It's something that people speculate with. Gold is not a speculative asset. I mean, gold is a conservative safe haven store of value. So the conversation really shouldn't be about Bitcoin versus gold. It mm -hmm. should be Bitcoin versus Ether or one of the other, you know, 12,000 cryptocurrencies, or should I buy Bitcoin or an NFT or maybe a meme stock? You know, what, what, what should I gamble on? You know, wh where should I try to bet that, you know, other people are going to come in and, and pay a higher price. You know, gold is the opposite of what Bitcoin is, right? Bitcoin is not uh, a store of value because there's no value there to store. I mean, Bitcoin has a price. And when you're buying Bitcoin, you're just speculating that the price goes up. You're not storing anything. You're not conserving anything. Gold is uh, a store of value because gold is a metal that is used throughout the economy, throughout industry. There are lots of uses for gold. There are probably many uses for gold that haven't even been developed yet, but may be developed in 500 years or 1,000 years, and they'll use the gold that we have right now, that we're storing, that we're not you know, uh, using because gold uh, doesn't erode. It doesn't tarnish. It doesn't lose any of its properties uh, over time, so it's the ideal store of value, and it worked great as money, uh, for thousands of years. Uh, we're not really using it as a monetary unit today. It's more used as a metal, but it is also used as a store of value. But I do think one day it will be remonetized. I think we will be using gold as a medium of exchange, as a unit of account, as we have in the past. But what I think will be different about a future gold standard than a past gold standard is I think most of the gold transactions will take place you know, through the internet either through uh, a digital currency that is backed by and redeemable in gold or through other companies where gold is stored uh, with a, you know, a reliable uh, vault or a bank or a private company that can, that can you know, make that gold available uh, through uh, digital uh, tra transactions. You know, that, that's where paper money initially came from. People were using gold as money, but it was inconvenient sometimes to carry around a lot of gold or to use gold for smaller transactions. And so you would take your gold to a goldsmith and later a bank, and they would give you a warehouse receipt, which is called currency. And so you could 
transact in the currency, but what gave the currency value, because it was just made of paper, what gave the currency value is that it was an IOU for actual gold that was on deposit someplace else. Well, in the modern world, instead of having a piece of paper that evidences ownership of gold that you transact, you can have a digital version of that piece of paper that evidence ownership and transact in that. And then you can use your gold to buy a cup of coffee because you can break down an ounce of gold into fractions of a gram. And you know it works a lot better than, than, than the cryptocurrencies because you have something of real value and then you can actually price goods and services in it. Uh, it can act as a unit of account. It could do exactly what it did in the past, in the future, except it could do it more efficiently because of today's improved uh, uh, technology that makes a gold standard even better now than it, than it was in the past. And it worked great in the past. Okay. That's that point where you make that a gold backed by, uh, or a cryptocurrency backed by gold uh, is interesting because it shows at least you understand the tech side of things. You, It's like you're not against the tech side. It's more where the value is created. I do just want to correct you on something. Nobody's buying coffee uh, with Bitcoin. I bought this cup of coffee this morning from the cafe here with Bitcoin on the Lightning well, Network. How, well, how much, does it cost? how much does the transaction cost? Oh, it's close to zero because I use the Lightning Network. So the Lightning Network is like a layer two technology. So, so it would be significantly less than me using Visa because. Um, well, but the, but but the coffee merchant. What's the store? What's do they they the guy collects Bitcoin and wanted some Bitcoin. So he allows you to pay in dollars. Uh, in cash, uh, use your card, or in Bitcoin. And he keeps a certain amount in Bitcoin, and he keeps a certain mm. amount of dollars and run his business. The girl who works on the counter is quite interesting because she gets paid in dollars, and she just keeps all her tips in Bitcoin. But it was more just like, uh, just correcting that point, we said no one's doing it because they are doing it. Well, um, well, I'm surprised you're... Yeah, well, do you, I mean, why, why would you... If you think Bitcoin's going up so much, why do you want to exchange it for a glass of cup of coffee? When, well, wouldn't you want to use your fiat... Well, I mean, I'm I've got a I've got a good amount of Bitcoin now. So, like spending two or three dollars of Bitcoin is a is a is a rounding error in terms of the the amount I own. All right, so you've got well, you've got enough of it now that you're that you're able to spend it. Well, it's a sort another slight difference though is also when I flew over, I didn't have any dollars on me. There isn't a cash machine here where I'm in El Zonte, so it's just it was a lot more convenient. Oh, you're down. Oh, that's right, you're down in yeah. El Salvador now. Yeah, yeah so yeah. it's a lot more convenient. So okay. it's an El Salvador coffee shop that's taken the Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah. So, oh, okay. I forgot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but what the point being is like it's just a correction on that nobody is. Yeah. Because they because because they are. Okay. That was a that was a good intro. Greg Foss, over to you. You can uh, you can jump in and do your opening remarks. So um, I'd like just to uh, to state that uh, you know while the narrative sometimes is that Bitcoin is digital gold, I prefer to think of it actually, Peter, as digital energy, or more exact encrypted energy okay i'm an engineer at uh at the undergrad level um the first law of thermodynamics conservation of energy runs deep in my veins uh if you think of bitcoin as digital energy and the ability to store energy over time and space i think that will clear up the narrative that it has no value well i um, didn't I didn't know that it stored. I didn't know that it stored energy. So, I mean, can I drive my car on Bitcoin? Can I just? I don't need a gas station. I could just like hook my cell phone up to my car, and it's going to suck out the Bitcoin, and I can drive around, or I can power my house with my Bitcoin. Yes, you can, sir. Yes, you can because you can. Pay okay, guys, 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 guys. <laughs> I'm going to interrupt very early and say yeah. these debates always fail when people talk over each other. Okay. So I, I will direct to each other. These are opening right. remarks for Greg. He was very patient. All right. So, I was just so, curious how it Yeah, how no, it was we'll energy. get to that, Peter. We'll get to okay. it. But he, yeah. here's the thing. So if you think of it as d encrypted energy, uh, we all know that uh, every uh, advancement in human productivity is accompanied by a uh, an increase in energy efficiency or energy productivity. Uh, I believe Bitcoin to be that case. Um, I am not an anti-gold I understand your arguments for gold. Gold worked well for 3,000 to 5,000 years. It demonetized silver. The countries that stayed on the silver standard were notably disadvantaged when the world moved to uh, a gold peg. And everything that you said is true about fiat currencies when they're backed by gold, but that stopped, right? And so I think as common ground between the two of us, we'll both agree that the fiat 
currency is currently a Ponzi. And you argue that there's no price. Uh, you shouldn't look at price. Well, I'll be an open market uh, participant and I'll say prices are truth. And at any given point in time in the present, the price is the most important piece of information you can disseminate from a market. And Bitcoin, very simply, is trading for a value to make the math simple of $50,000 a Bitcoin. You argue that it's got no value. I would argue the reverse. I would say that while it's encrypted energy, the value of Bitcoin, much like the value of gold, is that it's the anti-fiat, okay? Uh, I'll say that Bitcoin, the value of Bitcoin is the network, the ability to transfer value over time and space, and it'll settle in 10 minutes, much like when I sent Spencer his uh, birthday present over a year ago of some Bitcoin. He sent me his wallet. I sent him some Bitcoin. He was at liberty to spend or to trans transfer that Bitcoin right into fiat money on his Bitcoin wallet if he so choose. I hope he didn't because it's up five times since I sent him that that uh, store of he, value. He didn't. He still has it. Which I'm, I'm happy for, <laughs> Peter, because here's the reality, okay? I've been involved in Bitcoin since it was under $1,000 a Bitcoin. And I sincerely believe that Bitcoin represents better risk adjusted value today at its price today than it did when it was under a thousand dollars very simply the asymmetry of the trade opportunity in front of us right now in my opinion is better than it was at a thousand dollars a bitcoin why the network is stronger it's the most the world's most powerful computer network with no centralization absolutely controlled by nobody. You argue that there's 12,000 other coins. Just because there's 12,000 other equities, does that mean that you shouldn't own a specific equity that you think offers the best possible return like an Amazon? Just because Jeff Bezos brought Amazon to the world, there was plenty of other equities you could invest in, but that happened to be one of the best ones you could put your money in. So who owned Amazon from the outset besides Jeff Bezos and his mother? Probably nobody, right? Because everybody tries to harvest gains. But the reality is, at the end of the day, Bitcoin, like any other investment opportunity, is determined by price in the here and now. And you have to understand that if you have no exposure to Bitcoin and it goes up another hundredfold, you are taking a tremendous risk relative to having a proper portfolio allocation. So all of this will always come back from my perspective of trading risk for over 30 years. You need to look at the asymmetry of the return opportunity, something that can go up a hundredfold and it can fall by a hundred percent or you can lose all your money doesn't mean you shouldn't own it. And very simply going back to the equity uh, analogy. 30 years ago, the components of the Dow Jones Industrials look vastly different than they do today, right? And those equities over time tend to go to zero. But in the interim, they can go a lot higher and survive forever. We can argue the past because that's all that we have factual information on. The future is nothing more than a prediction. And as a risk manager, it's my opinion that if you have zero exposure to Bitcoin, you are not managing your risk properly, provided we both agree on common ground, which is that fiat currencies are the Ponzi. And I think we would agree on that. Fiat currencies right now are the Ponzi scheme. And more importantly, you argue that, okay, we'll create a digital backed currency, excuse me, a gold backed currency using digital, uh, C potentially central bank digital currencies. Boy, I'm going to, I'm going to love to see that because that means that you've got to convert your whole fiat standard back to a gold standard. And then you have to take control of that gold, gold out of the hands of the central bankers. So, hey, we may get there, there's, sir, yeah. but I would <laughs> just a, like, to, like to yeah, have... There's, there's, let me do the in between. Let me do the in between yeah. and let you unpack it. Just, uh, Greg, just a quick question. Uh, I just put you on that. 
Um, half the argument, half the argument you made there about why you should invest in Bitcoin, I think, would also be uh, uh, fair to Ethereum and NFTs. Two things I don't invest in myself because I don't believe in them. Uh, you said the asymmetry and the opportunity, and it's uh, you know basically based on the potential returns. I could you can make the same argument for Ethereum. And I, d- I disagree. I disagree. The okay. one thing about Bitcoin that you love is the fact that it's twenty one million. That's what you know about Bitcoin, math and code, 21 million. Okay. Peter, there's a lot to unpack there. I'll, I'll, I'll let you go. Yeah, before I even start the unpacking, just a comment on the last thing that you said about uh, a return to a gold standard, which would be great if uh, sovereign nations went back on a gold standard. But that doesn't happen. Individuals on their own can decide that they want to save in gold and transact in gold, just like people are you know, doing this with Bitcoin. There's nothing that stops people from having, you know, a digital currency backed by gold other than the, gov- the regulations that, that drive up the cost. But there's nothing that stops people from, you know, like, you know, like my, my bank when I eventually can get it up, the damn thing up and running. Uh, but where I have gold as a currency, my core banking software, you know, looks at gold the way it looks at euros, pounds, yen, dollars. And you can do everything with gold that you can with those currencies at basically the same cost. So individuals don't have to wait for the government. If they want to own gold, if they want to uh, accept payment in gold, uh, they can do it. And it's very efficient and very simple. So we don't have to wait for the government to do it. But to get back to all the things that you were saying, I mean, first of all, the idea that price is truth. I mean, it's only truth in a sense that price reflects the popular opinion at the time that the price is being set. But more often than not, the popular opinion is wrong. I mean, you go back at all kinds of bubbles, you know, was price truth uh, in 2000? So many of those dot-com stocks went to zero, right? People were paying 50, 100, $200 a share, and they went to zero. So price wasn't truth. Price wasn't truth when people were paying par for subprime mortgages that went to zero. But it was truth to the extent that People were making a mistake collectively, and the price did not accurately reflect the value of the underlying asset that was being priced. And so that's the situation with these cryptocurrencies. Yes, the $50,000 price is an accurate representation of the market today based on what people are willing to pay to buy Bitcoin and how few people that own Bitcoin want to sell. But you know, you fast forward to some point in the future when you have a different situation, when very few people want to buy and everybody's looking to get rid of their Bitcoin, you're going to have a much lower price. So just because the the price is high doesn't mean the market is right uh, to assign that price. Now, when you're talking about, um, well, you should buy, you know, Bitcoin, you know, you got 12,000 cryptocurrencies, And try to compare that to, you know, how many stocks there are, you know, 500, obviously, in the S&P, 2,000 stocks in uh, the Russell 2000. Yes, those individual companies are much different from one another than any of these cryptocurrencies are different from the other. You're talking about a different business with a different, uh, you know, customer base, different revenue, business model, risk profiles, competitive, you know, they're businesses. They generate income. They pay dividends to the shareholders. So depending on my outlook over a sector or an industry or a management team or all different things, there's a lot of differences uh, between stocks. And it makes sense to diversify uh, because things could happen to a business that you don't expect. Things can go wrong with a company uh, that you don't anticipate. But when it comes to all these cryptocurrencies, as far as I'm concerned, the biggest difference is the name. I mean, yeah, some of them are a little different, you know, proof of work, proof of stake, what the cap is. Bitcoin is 21 million. There's nothing magical about that number. There are plenty of other cryptocurrencies that also have caps. There are other cryptocurrencies that have an inflation rate that's built in at a a very low level. I mean, there's all sorts of gimmicks out there, and they're going to keep coming up with you know, new ones, as long as there's demand, as long as there are people out there willing to buy these things, the supply is going to keep growing and growing and growing. And eventually, though, you're going to have all this supply and the price is going to stop going up. I mean, it only goes up. You know, you talked about fiat currency being a Ponzi. These fiat cryptocurrencies are also Ponzi's. The only reason they go up 
is because people want to buy them. And the only reason people want to buy them is because they think they can sell them to other people who are only buying them because they can do the same thing. But eventually, you run out of new people and the whole thing collapses. I think I think me and uh, Greg would probably agree with you on some of these fiat cryptocurrencies. I think that's why there is this separation between those who are Bitcoin only and those people who are into the broad crypto. Um, I mean, but I, have, you- I want to ask one question, though, because this is one thing, though, I got to ask because mm. um, I don't get it. So if Bitcoin is stored energy, this is I don't understand. I know it takes a lot of energy to to mathematically solve the problem to create a Bitcoin. So a lot of energy is used to create a Bitcoin. But you're saying that I can liberate that energy, that all that energy is somehow stored within the Bitcoin and I can extract it and power my my house with it or drive my car with it. There's actually energy that I can release from the Bitcoin and, and use it? Well, yes, because you can convert it back to energy by buying energy with it. No, 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 but that, that, that doesn't convert it to energy. Now I have to buy new energy that has to be produced all over again. A store of energy would mean that I can just take my Bitcoin and crack it open and the energy comes out. To say that, well, I can use it to buy energy, well, now that somebody has to make that energy from scratch so I can buy it. That means Bitcoin isn't storing anything. What you're just saying is I could use Bitcoin to buy energy if somebody is dumb enough to buy my Bitcoin. But if no one wants my Bitcoin, I don't have any energy. Think of it as in terms of the miners who are uh, using excess energy, which goes to waste. So whether that's the excess energy that isn't used at hydro dams or excess energy that isn't used uh, f- uh, flaring, what they're doing is they're, they're turning that excess energy into a pristine asset, which they can then use no, to buy no, no, energy. No, they're wasting it. They're wasting it on Bitcoin. They could have used that energy to do something else. It's not like they just have all this extra energy and they got nothing to do with it. <laughs> they, they use it to make Bitcoin because they can sell the Bitcoin at a profit right now because there's a bunch of fools that are willing to buy it. That's what's going on. But we're wasting energy. We're not storing anything. We're wasting it. Yeah, you know, I'm jumping in when I'm meant to moderate. Greg, yeah. I'll, I'll let you ask. I'll let you answer that. So um, there's a lot for me to unpack in that one. Uh, look, I want to. I, I want to take one step backwards first, Peter. And I like your analysis, Peter Schiff. I like your analysis in terms of debating whether where where prices can go. They can go in either direction, though, right? What if Bitcoin is actually super cheap right now? You're arguing that it's super overvalued. I'm actually arguing that it's super undervalued. And I well, come up I with mean, my intrinsic, it's Peter, excuse me. I come up with my intrinsic value calculation using credit default swaps on sovereign nations on the outstanding amount of debt that these sovereign nations hold. By that very basic calculation, I feel that Bitcoin's worth over $150,000 per Bitcoin uh, based on the insurance that it provides against the default of sovereign nations. And you may say, oh my goodness, the U.S. will never default. I'll argue that the U.S. actually did default back in 1971 when it went off the gold standard. Uh, this is some, you know, this is a uh, 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 argument that can be uh, debated on both sides. But here's my point. The value of Bitcoin is the network. Okay, It's the strongest computer network in the world. These other coins may be competing for that same supremacy, but right now they don't have it. Bitcoin is the strongest computer network in the world, bar none. It offers the ability to transfer value, whether you call that value digital energy, which I like to call it, and you argue it, it's not. You can transfer value across the world. It will settle in 10 minutes and the person that receives it can turn that into a cup of coffee if they want. They can go to a gas station and buy gasoline and put it in their car if they want. Very simply, you are transferring value across the world's most secure computer network with no centralized control. You're transferring Bitcoin. Whether or not Bitcoin has any value depends on the market. Maybe people will want to buy Bitcoin. Maybe they won't. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I'm not transferring anything of substance. I'm just transferring uh, the, the Bitcoin. But, you know, if your argument is that the fair value of Bitcoin is triple the current price. You're saying 150,000 and now it's at 50,000. To me, that is not a good risk reward. 
if I can only triple my money or lose it all, I mean, that for me- That value will go up, Peter, as the price of the credit default swap market reflects higher probability of default. The implied well, value I, of Bitcoin increases as the CDS spreads increase. Well, I look, if, look, I agree with you that we defaulted in 1971. Uh, I, I, Said that myself, you know, uh, Roosevelt defaulted to the, to, the, to the American public in 1933. We defaulted to the world in 1971. I do think that we could have a breakdown of the dollar. A lot of this bad stuff can happen. That's why I own a lot of gold stocks, a lot of silver stocks. I think these stocks that I own, betting on a monetary meltdown in the United States, betting on a crisis in the U.S. dollar, I think some of these stocks could go up you know, 20x, 50x, 100x, uh, some of my junior mining stocks. So, you know, I like those odds, uh, you know, and I don't think, you know, these stocks have the risk of zeroing out like, like Bitcoin does. So if I'm going to gamble on that type of outcome, that's where I want to do it. You know, I don't want to buy something for 50,000 that was 10 years ago was under a dollar and somehow say that it's cheap even though it's gone up so much, and to say that somehow it's less risky at 50,000 than you said when it was at 1,000, I think it's more risky. The price is higher, there's more risk, more people know about it. At least when I first heard about it, you know, 12 years ago, whatever, 11 years ago, when it was under $10, you know, at least back then, I mean, there weren't that many people who knew about it because I didn't know about it until somebody told me about it, right? Uh, but now everybody knows about it. I mean, it's, you know, it, it's all anybody talks about. So to say that, you know, this is new, this is a ground floor, when everybody knows about it, everybody's talking about it, you know, high school kids own it, junior high school kids own it, you know, th this, this looks like a bubble that's peaked, not, you know, the beginning of some new bull market. Respectfully, Peter, there, is other, there are other gold bugs out there with exactly the same arguments as you have on the relative cheapness, if you will, of gold equities versus other equities out there. Multiples, uh, you know, enterprise value to EBITDA. I will bring up a very wise gold investor that I've come to know, Lawrence Leppard, who believes in all the things you're saying, but also believes you need the diversification into Bitcoin because what if Bitcoin goes to our price targets, and I'm including Lawrence here, of over a million dollars of Bitcoin? What if? And nobody can categorically rule that that is not a possibility. You may say that well, it's close to zero. Hold on, Peter, right. please. Okay. I will just say this. Imagine, sir, if you had put 1% of your gold portfolio into Bitcoin when it was at $10 a Bitcoin. A 1%. You're risking 1% yeah, of your I'd portfolio. Yeah, I'd be a billionaire right you, now. Yeah, I know that. You, your okay, portfolio would if be I up sold. 50 times. 50, five, zero, your whole portfolio would be up 50 times. That's what risk management is. And I'm just going to respectfully tell you that I think Bitcoin at $50,000 of Bitcoin is still a rounding error in terms of the price that it can well, attain over time. To me, I don't, I don't care how high the price of Bitcoin goes up. Even if it goes to a million dollars of Bitcoin, it's not going to affect me. I'm not going to lose anything. I don't want to own Bitcoin. And so what do I care how high the price goes if I'm never going to buy it? The question is, what are all the people going to do with their Bitcoin when they want to buy something? Because I'm buying real things, right? I own real businesses. I own real estate. I own stuff that I can actually use. If all you own is Bitcoin, you want to buy the stuff that I already have. Everybody, everybody who's buying Bitcoin wants, to, wants what I already have. I don't want any of their Bitcoin. So the, the risk is that you hold all your Bitcoin and you ultimately can't buy anything with it because even if it goes to a million and now all the Bitcoin millionaires and billionaires, they all want to cash out. They all want to buy a nice house. They want to buy a new car. They want to buy a boat. They want to buy a plane. They want to buy new clothes. They want to travel. Okay, sell your Bitcoin. Who's going to buy it? And Peter, now the how, price is going to collapse. How much energy do you own, Peter? How many energy equities do you own? Do you have a zero uh, exposure? No, no. I have a lot of energy companies. On behalf, you know, of, your com uh, behalf of your unit holders or in your own personal, your, your own yeah, PA? Well, we own, well, I own a lot of, I own a lot of um, you know, oil and gas uh, stocks. We own oil companies in our funds. 
I also own I also own a lot of base metals that I think you know because I I look at the at you know the electric cars. So I own a lot of copper. I own a lot of nickel. You know, zinc. I own other metals that I think may be in demand if we move more away from the fossil fuels. But I own a lot of those too. I mean, yeah, I own a lot of agriculture stocks. I, I own I own a lot of stocks. I mean, gold stocks are part of my portfolio. They're the most speculative part. But I have a lot of far more conservative. Uh, companies around the world across a broad spectrum of, of, of industries. Uh, I just try to find stocks that I think represent good investment value that pay good dividends. How many equities have you owned in your 30 plus year career that have gone to zero? Several. I don't know the exact number. I've owned some speculative companies that have gone bankrupt. Good, good. That's what you're supposed to do because that means that, means that you are taking the risk on behalf of your unit holders that will sometimes not work out to the downside. Okay, excuse me, to the upside. It 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 was a it was a bagel. Okay. You got bageled on a number of equities. That's what any good risk manager should happen because if they're too conservative, they're sitting in a room doing nothing, they're earning a ETF like passive return on an index, or you're an active portfolio manager trying to properly risk adjust a portfolio. The big problem I have with you, Peter, is that you are out there saying to people that don't have proper portfolio diversification that they shouldn't touch Bitcoin. In fact, this can change some lives of people like the El Salvadorians who, by the way, their president, you may think it's funny. I think that it's a brilliant decision to in to make Bitcoin legal tender just from a GDP perspective where he'll increase his GDP by 4% because remittances will not be basically uh, stolen from the population by the likes of Western Union. You can do this on a network. Look, West, look Western Union charges $4.95 to send up to $500. I mean, this is not an enormous fee. Baloney. And, Baloney. It's and 20%. I don't know what the no, it's not. Look on their website. It's not 20%. Man, I mean, it's 20% if you want to send like $10 or $20, but I mean, that's too small an amount to send, but it's gonna, they're going to waste so much money buying, taking their dollars, buying Bitcoin, shipping the Bitcoin, getting rid of the Bitcoin. Most merchants are not going to accept payment in Bitcoin. They're going to want to get payment in dollars. You're talking about how people could get rich on Bitcoin. People can go broke on Bitcoin. I mean, this is not going to end well for El Salvador. I mean, this is a Hail Mary for El Salvador. But I don't know. I mean, maybe some of the guys high up in government are, you know, have been bought off. I don't know what's going on behind the scenes, but it, it doesn't smell right to me. Okay, listen, so we don't jump around subjects, but I think El Salvador is an interesting subject. I also think remittance is an interesting subject, and there's nuance in both. I just want to just want to go back a step, uh, Peter, where you mentioned people uh, uh, want to buy things eventually with Bitcoin. So I am somebody who does buy things with Bitcoin, so it does happen. Sometimes I'm paying with the Bitcoin, and uh, sometimes I'm converting the Bitcoin to cash and buying things with it. But that is happening. So people are buying things with Bitcoin. You can... You can buy with Bitcoin on the Shift Gold website. No, your well, own website. again, people people don't understand the difference. When you go to the Shift Gold website, there's a company that's in it the middle yeah, called, no, called, called BitPay. So you're basically selling your Bitcoin to BitPay. Then BitPay is selling the taking the Bitcoin, selling them and getting dollars, and then giving the dollars to Shift Gold. So yeah, no, there's an that. intermediary company in there. It's not where Shift Gold is selling gold in Bitcoin because we don't want Bitcoin because we have to buy gold from wholesalers. They want dollars. We have rent. The landlord wants dollars. We have employees. They need dollars because their rents are in dollars. The grocery store wants dollars. The government wants taxes in dollars. So nobody can transact no, in Bitcoin. That. I understand that, yeah. but, I, but I want to understand what's the difference between that and say when I come here to El Salvador and I use my debit card, they don't send them pounds. There's companies in between that convert those pounds into dollars, so they have dollars here. How's that any different? It's just no, a no. currency when, conversion. Right. When, you, when, when you're using your debit card and if you have, you know, you have dollars in your account and no, you I have go pounds. into it. I have pounds. Right, you have pounds in your account and you go to a store in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and there's dollars the bank will do the FX for you. They're going to take yeah. the currency that you own, sell it to get to get but, the pounds. Yes. But what is the difference? What is it? It's just a currency conversion by an intermediary. Well, it's not really a currency conversion. It's an asset sale into a currency because Bitcoin isn't a currency. 
You know, Bitcoin is a token, right? I can look. I, I, I you, but by what you're saying is, I could go and buy uh, a cup of coffee with IBM, right? Because I can have an app that takes my IBM shares, sells them for dollars, and then uses the dollars to buy a coffee. I mean, you can sell anything and then use the proceeds to buy something. Uh, that's not using it. You know, hold you're, on, you're, hold you're, on, Peter. <laughs> I, just, I, I just want to focus on that point. You said people aren't using uh, Bitcoin. Uh, whether you call, think it's a currency or token, it, it, it's kind of irrelevant. I mean, it's a currency in El Salvador. It's a legal currency as of Tuesday. So it is a currency here. But I, I don't understand the difference, the actual difference between me using my debit card to spend pounds and you getting dollars and me using my Bitcoin wallet to spend Bitcoin and you getting dollars. It's the same scenario. No, well, it's it, it's similar in that you, you, the, the, you're not paying in the same unit that the merchant is selling in because there's a third party that's in, in between. But the way it's being done with Bitcoin can be you could use any asset. You could you could have you could have any stocks. You could have a, a you know anything that has a sure. liquidity. Anything that has a market can be sold right to get cash. Right. I, I, could, I could go right now. I have a debit card against my brokerage account. So I can go and buy a cup of coffee by borrowing money against my stock portfolio. Right. So it's it's it, it, but it's not it's not being used. The the price of the of the of the of the merchandise is not Bitcoin. And I guarantee you that in El Salvador, nobody is going to have Bitcoin prices on their merchandise. It's not going to be here is a gallon of milk. And here is the price in Satoshi's. The price will be in U.S. dollars. Even if they accept payment in Bitcoin, they're going to negotiate the transact, the pay, the, the, the conversion rate. Nobody is going to price their products in Bitcoin because it's impossible. But they don't price their, uh, they don't price things here in pounds either. So I'm just saying that it's like well, no, 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 they price things in dollars. Yeah, they price things in dollars, and, and I they're and they're not going to they're not going to start pricing anything in Bitcoin even when it's legal tender next week. Yeah, but they don't price it in pounds, but I spend my pounds on a debit card and they get dollars and they price it in dollars and they spend my Bitcoin and they get dollars. They can get dollars or they can choose to keep the Bitcoin. Yes. In that respect, yes, it's similar. That's why I tell people I do the same thing with gold. You can yeah. have gold and you can have gold in your account and you can have a debit card and you can. But you're not actually spending your gold because I have to liquidate the gold to get the money. Now, what could be done if the merchant wanted gold, I could take the gold and transfer it from the customer's account to the merchant's account, and then they would be paying in gold. But no, what I'm doing is I'm selling the gold to get the dollars because the dollar is the currency, not the gold. Okay. okay. Well, I mean, I, I don't think there's much of a difference. But but Greg, uh, do you want to jump in? I'll agree. Now, now can, can, can I add, look, guys, will we agree that money has always been a technology or essentially a ledger? Because, Peter, what you're saying brings me back to a story. Did you ever hear about this guy that's walking through town and he's got a cow for sale for $600,000 and the townsfolk are laughing at him? And three days later, he's walking through town with three chickens and they said, I told you you'd never sell your cow for $600,000. And he goes, damn right, I did. I sold it for these three $200,000 chickens, right? It makes no difference. It's a ledger. It's basically, that's what money is. It's a, well, it's And triple entry accounting in the Bitcoin standard is the most secure ledger ever created by man. And it doesn't well, matter whether you're paying in Bitcoin or in gold or in pounds or all fiats, which are melting ice cubes. It's nothing but a ledger. And that is why price is so important. It, it's not a ledger. So the way money came about is it was an improvement over barter, right? Where I, I, I have one particular commodity and I trade it for a commodity that I need. But that's always, you know, cumbersome. You know, if I am a chair maker and I need a new pair of shoes, I got to find a shoemaker who wants my chair. And it's, you know, it's difficult. But what man discovered was like, hey, if we can have one commodity that we can, you know, we all can trade in and we could use that commodity as money then we won't have to find a counterparty. And so a lot of different commodities served as money over time, but gold ended up being 
the best commodity, the commodity best suited to function as money because of a lot of properties that it had. And these are the kind of properties that Bitcoin tries to replicate. But gold would not have been money, but for its value as a metal, as a, as a valuable commodity that people needed. And so the real definition of money is the most liquid commodity. It's the commodity that's most easily exchanged for other commodities, other goods and services. It's not simply an empty ledger on an accounting statement. The accounting statement is going to reflect the, the amount of gold that you have. Gold, it's a quantity of gold uh, because the more gold you have, the more metal you have. And the more metal you have, the more stuff you can make with the metal. But to say that uh, the, the properties of a commodity can be completely stripped away from money, and we're going to say this worthless token with no real use is now going to be money because we all say so, and we're all going to just believe in it, well, that's the, that's the concept of fiat currency. It's, it has value because we believe it has value. But at least in a fiat currency, you have a government you know, behind it, whereas with Bitcoin, there's nothing behind it. So, Peter, one of the things you've said that I think I think I've seen you tweet it before is that Bitcoin doesn't have any real use cases beyond um, just being the transfer of that token. Um, so, one of the things I just wanted to raise into this, and I'll let uh, Greg interject, is that uh, are, do you understand the the difference between Bitcoin as the token and then Bitcoin as the payment rails? Well. I don't understand how my ownership of a Bitcoin gives me ownership of that payment rail and how that generates any income to me. I mean, what I do know is that all the people who own Bitcoin collectively are basically taxed by all the miners to maintain the network. And so they have to- and They're not you know, taxed. They're, Sorry, that's, that's incorrect. They're not taxed. They, they well, they're, well there's, a, there's a cost. Like they're, they're mining Bitcoin and selling it. And so they're increasing the supply of Bitcoin. And so that has to you know, come at the expense of all the people- who own Bitcoin, right? Because no, no, it doesn't. It, it does. It, it's not that. It well, you're diluting. So if some, if the, if the supply of Bitcoin goes up, right? Doesn't that somewhat dilute the supply that is already out there? It dilutes I mean, the supply that's already out there, but but we already know that the fix. There's already there is actually already 21 million Bitcoin. Just some haven't been mined yet. But right, you're not they haven't been mined, the but, they're, but they're, you're not diluting all, the supply. All, all the costs, right? All the energy, all the labor, all the computers that are used to maintain Bitcoin network, where, where's all the money coming from to pay all those people? Well, so, <laughs> yeah. So so they charge a transaction fee to use the network. Um, so if you want to use the network and you want to send Bitcoin to somebody, you, you pay a transaction fee. So that's Right, so that, that's like a tax, right? It's, I mean, a, no, no, even it's not if, a tax. It's not a tax. That, that's well, like saying I, if, if I buy uh, services from Shift Gold, it's a tax. It's not. It's, an, it's a free market. No, but. no. But, okay, I mean, I'm not saying tax like it's a government, but I'm saying that there are fees that are being assessed yeah. to the Bitcoin community um, the thing, sorry, in order we, we, to maintain the, the net network. To verify the ledger, to verify the, the immutable ledger. It's verifying every single transaction that's happened yes, yes, on the and blockchain. It costs money. It's beautiful. It's not free. Okay, that's Peter, no point. disrespect, but you know how much how much forged gold is there out there? How do you verify every single piece of gold? You know, there's I don't have I, to. I don't want to get the, of course you do, sir, because there's Russian gold in vaults that act is actually tungsten. You've seen that before. I'm afraid it's true. And and then you talk about the supply. The beautiful thing about the supply of Bitcoin is it's absolutely programmed. Mathematically, you know what the supply is. What if the price of Bitcoin doubles? One sec, Peter, please. What, what if the, the price of Bitcoin doubles? Does the supply change? No, it doesn't. What if the price of gold doubles? Do you think the supply of gold coming out of the ground is likely to change? I would well, say yes. It, it, it's highly not likely. Immediately, not immediately. It doesn't also matter. Depends, it, no, it's not it, programmed, it, Peter. It's not programmed. Okay, what you're saying, though, is a bunch of nonsense. I mean, first of all, if the price of gold were to double, there's a good chance that the cost of mining it would go up quite a bit, too, if inflation is driving the gold price higher. But assuming that the cost of mining uh, gold only goes up 30% and the price of gold doubles, yes, there's going to be some more gold pulled out of the ground over time. It's not like it's immediate. It's going to take years to get the extra gold out of the ground. Uh, you know, mines have to be you know refurbished, or you know, it's not that easy. The supply of gold is not going to grow very dramatically. Historically, it grows maybe one to two percent a year, which is a fine, uh, steady supply increase relative to population growth and th things like that. Um, but yes, I mean. 
if the, the price of Bitcoin were to double, I think that there would be a little bit more mine because now, assuming the energy costs don't go up, more power can be devoted to mining no, Bitcoin. No, it and doesn't work like that. Hmm? It, does, it actually doesn't work like that. That's why we have the diff this, we have this thing called the difficulty adjustment that basically regulates. Right, so it'll just get it'll just get more expensive to mine it. Is what you're saying? And so, because there'll be because there'll be more competition. Yeah. All right. But, but you know. So but. But what happens when the price of Bitcoin collapses? Then what? Well, what happens if it goes, you know, it's... We say you know, same thing. We get another yeah. difficulty adjustment down. So it's, that, that's just programmed in to, to keep the supply regulated. Yeah. But the thing is, there's no real demand. You don't know. You're all speculating that people are going to want Bitcoin in the future. You have no idea that anyone's going to want Bitcoin in the future. They may not. I mean, Bitcoin has a very short history to really extrapolate anything. It's not like it's been around for 100 years or 1,000 years. You can say, yeah, look, see, people have wanted it. It's been around for a decade. That is a very, very short period in, in the scheme of things. And when you talk about, oh, we know for sure there's only 21 million. Yeah, that's what we think. How do you know? How do you know that's not going to change? Math and code. I mean, how do you Math and code. Yeah, but decentralized. How do you know? There's right, no, right, it's right. decentralized. You cannot change that. Yeah, well, well, how do you know that some miners that, that can't get together and take control of the network, they have enough of the mining, that they can increase the supply of Bitcoin and decide it's not 21 million. There's yeah, going to be more. Because the miners can't do that on their own. So that's the... That's it's when you the want nodes. It's the nodes. It's all about the nodes. Well, how do, but maybe they can't do it now, but maybe they will be able to do it tomorrow. Things change. Technology evolves. People discover new things that they didn't think they could do. Right at one point, people didn't think we could fly. Right? Oh, that's impossible. We, we were, you know. But now, you know, we got planes. You know, th Peter. things happen. <laughs> no, you, 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 I mean, you make a point. Things can change, but it, it, it's to 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 put an analogy for you. It's the chance of the Bitcoin increasing the twenty one million supply is probably similar to the chance of me being able to. Uh, uh, um, uh, convert, I don't know, lead into gold. It's 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 very very difficult because of the way the uh, uh, the network's been set up. But but I did want to focus on a slightly different point. Is I think what I've um, isolated one of your points is that big, uh, gold has an industrial use that gives it a uh, floor value. And you 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 stated before that. Bitcoin doesn't have any use beyond the token. But actually, the payment rails has now been used to the point where one, so just one example, a company called Strike, they've essentially created an international Venmo. So I can send my fiat currency to any other currency in the world, and they get an instant conversion with, and it's, they receive the money instantly at almost zero cost to transact. So I could send. What does it have to do with Bitcoin? Well, it, it happens on the Bitcoin rails. This happens on the Bitcoin all right, well, network. So, all right. Well, but how so does that. But why but, but, do you? But can that happen on the Bitcoin rails? If Bitcoin was a thousand dollars, does it have yeah. to be at fifty thousand dollars? Yeah, it does. So it, it doesn't, doesn't matter, matter what price Bitcoin is; those rails are still available. Yeah. Those, so what I'm so to, so what so the, I, so I don't understand how those rails are giving Bitcoin any value. I mean, if I own a Bitcoin, I'm not getting paid every time somebody uses those rails. Um, <laughs> no, no. So I just wanted to just to, to finish this by saying, like, would you or would you not agree having an international Venmo, which is instant and zero cost, has some value? I, it, yes, I think it has value. It doesn't have value to somebody who owns a Bitcoin, though. Well, I mean, so I, don't, when, I, don't, I don't see how the two are related. Well, because what happens is the way the way it works is having liquidity in every country. So if you have more liquidity in every country that is powering this network, then the value of Bitcoin goes up. Why? The value of Bitcoin only goes up if people want to buy Bitcoin. And well, people if the do. people that own it don't want to sell it, if they want to hodl it. You, you, in order for the price of Bitcoin to go up, the people that own it have to not sell it. And then more people have to come in and buy it. Same That's the any, dynamic that you same need. Same as any asset. Same as any asset in the world. Now, does no, the, it's not. Does the internet That's not have the value? Same as any. Does the internet have value, Peter? No. It, ha it has value to businesses that use it to make more profits. Biz Look, I have. If you own a business, if you own a stock, you never have to sell that stock because the stock is paying dividends, or you know the the company is using its earnings to buy the stock from you, right? Because it's recycling its earnings in a share buyback. If I own real estate, I don't have to sell real estate. I can rent it out. I can live in it. This is nonsense to say that every asset is just a speculative token, and that the only way to make money is to sell it to somebody else. You're describing how do they get? How do they? How do they right? determine Stocks a price on that? Real, 
how do they determine a oh. price? It's a multiple of EBITDA or a multiple of cash flow. Plenty of stocks don't pay a dividend and don't have earnings, but there's still a value there on a nature of no, no, that that now that's different. If it's, if a company doesn't have any earnings and doesn't pay any dividends, when you're buying it, you are speculating that the company will eventually have earnings and pay dividends. And yes, that is a highly speculative stock investment because you're betting on earnings that you think will materialize in the future. But Bitcoin will never have earnings in the future. Do you own any of those stocks? I own. I do own of some. Uh, so then you're saying exactly the same thing. Look, it's exactly the same thing as what. No, it's not because Bitcoin will never. Bitcoin will never have earnings. It will never pay a dividend. What if it will energy is priced in Bitcoin? Bitcoin? What if energy becomes priced in Bitcoin? What if Russia decides they want to yeah. receive Bitcoin as opposed yeah. to U.S. dollars? Yeah, yeah, what, what, yeah, yeah, yeah. And what if what? If, and if I sprout you, wings, are you going to tell me that's fly. a zero percent chance? I mean, I'm chance? not going to what is if. It, no, why not? That's what no, risk no, management is. None of this is. stuff okay, is going to happen. You, you're in a fantasy oh, land. Stop! It's you, about risk management. It's about risk management. Hold on. We're losing. No, we're losing control. I'm not managing my risk by taking on a bunch of risk, right? I mean, that, that you're just, you know, that's what you try to say to sucker somebody into buying some of that. I'm not going to fall for that. We, we, you know, we're losing I, control not, here. Let, let, let's, let, let's bring it back. Let's bring it back. Because um, I think Peter Schiff agrees with Bitcoiners on 90% of economic issues. I think maybe the, more, maybe, yeah, maybe more, maybe the, 99%. So the solution is essentially two different technologies, really. One is gold, one one is Bitcoin. Uh, well, gold's and, not a technology. Gold's, well, <laughs> gold's just a commodity. It's well, just money, a great what money, are the cash great flows, store of What value. are the cash flows on gold again, Peter? What's the dividend that gold pays? Yeah, again. What is the dividend gold, that gold pays? Come on. You, let's, see, you, see, you see this watch? This is gold. So? I can make that. That's what you do with gold, or you yeah, all okay. these chips, Hold all on. the we, chips that are mining Bitcoin. They got gold inside. Right, gold is used in the world. It's an actual thing that people want, that people need, that has properties that okay. are very desirable for life. I okay. don't need Bitcoin for anything. I've never needed a Bitcoin. I never will need a Bitcoin. Nobody does needs a Bitcoin. They don't. You don't do anything so with it. It I'm has no try. value. There's so, no. So, it's just speculative. Okay, let's bring it hold back, on, Peter McCormick. Bring it back. Bring it back. Bring it back, Peter McCormick. So. I would uh, I would argue in different scenarios, different things make money due to the circumstances of them. So, for example, cigarettes can be money in a in a prison because they don't have real money, so they can be used as a currency. And because you smoke them, that's well, what gives them value. There's smokers in prison; they want to smoke a cigarette. Yeah, but some yeah, okay, that's a fair point. But I've yeah, also you can't said that, smoke your bitcoin. No, no, no. But although you, you have to be smoking something to buy a bitcoin. Oh boy. But you can still spend your bitcoin. And I just wanted to say, but you can't smoke it. You can't do anything except with it. buy okay. other stuff. Oh, Oh boy, explain. except buy other stuff. Much like cigarettes in prison can no, buy other stuff. You, guys, guys, guys. Stop. Okay. This because is... people smoke them. If you if there if there were no smokers in prison, cigarettes wouldn't be money. There's okay. gotta be people who want to smoke them. That's where you get real demand. Like you get real demand for gold from jewelers who want to make jewelry or from uh, computer companies that want to make chips. You have to have an end user. There is no end user to Bitcoin because there's no use for Bitcoin. Okay, let me put it a different way then, to Peter. For my my daughter plays this little game called Robux. That itself has a currency inside it. It only can be used to spend. Yet my yes. daughter wants Robux, and she wants to be able to spend those Robux within that network because it solves a problem, which means she can jump on a giraffe. And yeah, yeah, and I played network. Monopoly, and I had okay. Monopoly money too. It's the so, same so, difference. It has so, value in Monopoly. doesn't have okay. any value outside Monopoly. Okay, so you agree that within certain networks... Uh, tokens can have value as money if people want to exchange it and use it as money. Sure, in a game to okay. buy make believe stuff. Well, maybe, but 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 then I would argue <laughs> too. There are scenarios in the world that people need a different form of money because the current money doesn't work for them. So you yes, said yes, but Peter, a, Peter, a Peter, different just form of money, not the, not ma not fantasy make believe well, uh, digital Peter, tokens. But P Peter, this this is where this becomes important because uh, you look, you're you're a wealthy guy. You live in Puerto Rico. You have a comfortable life, but. Let's talk about people in different scenarios where this may be useful. So we had, I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, one would be uh, the Belarus protests against Lukashenko when states 
uh, employees wanted to strike, but they couldn't afford to strike. The only way they could get money was donations coming in via the Bitcoin network it instantly and near free, and they could convert that to uh, the local currency they can survive. Same with the NSARS protests in Nigeria. Same with people uh, in uh, women in parts of the Middle East who, who have to need ability to store money. I'm going to say, what I'm going to put to you is that their network, their circumstances of their life and what they're living is their version of Monopoly or their version of Robux, where somebody has created a currency for them, which is usable, which fundamentally changes their life. And to, to, to rag on that or not accept it or not even see it is actually harming something which is protecting human rights. Can you not even understand in those scenarios that there is a money for them in that network, similar to a game that allows them to be able to function. Yeah, well, since there has been this big speculative mania and the price of Bitcoin has gone up dramatically, you know, yeah, certainly people have benefited from that. And when it collapses, it's going to be the reverse. I mean, if you really want to empower people uh, that are unbanked or living in areas of the world where the, there's a lot of inflation and, and it's hard to be in the currency, they can do the same thing they're doing with Bitcoin with a legitimate cryptocurrency that was backed by gold somewhere that would actually have the stability that they need uh, to transact and to price things and to save. That would work much better than, than Bitcoin. But yeah, a lot of people think it's working because the price is at 50000 well, Peter, they're not going to think it's working so well when the price is, you know, at five thousand or one thousand, and they paid fifty thousand. Well, I've offered you that bet a few times, and you've you've never. Yeah, you guys always want to bet with me on Bitcoin. I got so if I bet every Bitcoin guy that wants to bet with me, Peter, I, I, one I, can, I, can I ask a oh, question? No, Greg, Greg, let me finish. Okay, sir. Sorry, sure, Greg, I'm, yeah. I'm on a train. I'm on. I'm on a train of thought here because I think actually, uh, I think if there's a chance that Peter Schiff can be convinced. Or understand some of this. It actually is actually a really good thing. Now, when you said yes, these people have benefited from the spec speculation of the price, and they have been able to use mo this form of money in that scenario. Are we therefore not proving the use case that decentralization is the uh, no? Is all, the all, bear, bear all with that's me, been proven. Me, Peter, 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 bear, bear with me. <laughs> I, I think I want before you just try and answer without thinking it through. Let's just think it through. We, we've talked about the fact that these people have benefited from this price appreciation. So they benefited from a market for this price existing. So, and and they've also benefited from the technology. So have we, have we not proven that the world does benefit from a decentralized form of money that is permissionless, that is censorship resistant? Isn't that the innovation? Where the innovation with gold is you can b make jewelry. The innovation with Bitcoin is you've created a money that governments can't control that can actually help people in certain scenarios. So therefore, there is a need to hold it and there is a use case for holding it. Well, first of all, I think governments can have a lot more control over it than you think if they put their minds to it. I mean, they can outlaw it. They can, they can, they can do a lot of things that would make it very difficult for law-abiding people to have anything to do with, with, with Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency. So it's not like it's beyond the reach of government. And in fact, it's far more likely that the government in the United States or other governments would ban gold, Bitcoin than they would gold, because it's very difficult to ban gold. I mean, even when uh, FDR made it illegal for Americans to own gold, it, w it was just in America where that was true, but Americans couldn't own monetary gold. They can have a gold watch. They can have a gold ring. In fact, I remember when I grew up, our silverware in my house was made of gold. Instead, people were making silver out of gold instead of silver. So people still own gold. And if you were a jeweler, you could buy gold. If you were, you know, if you needed it in industry, you were able to buy it. But you know, so it's difficult to ban a metal that is that is so used, you know, throughout uh, you know the world. But banning Bitcoin, which is, again, is used for nothing, is very easy. Governments can say, what do you need Bitcoin for? We're going to make it illegal. Uh, and, and, you know, if it's just going to exist in, you know, in the corners of the dark web and, and used, you know, in the underground economy by criminals, what's the value of that? I don't know. I mean, there's, again, there's 12,000 other cryptos that criminals could use. Peter, I, I do like talking to you about these subjects, but what frustrates me is sometimes with the the, the statements that either are either disingenuous or you just haven't done the work enough. Well, like what? Uh, well, so mainly used. Uh, well, well, firstly, you say that you, can't, you they can ban Bitcoin. Actually, they 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 can only legislate against it. They can't stop use. It. People still use it in China, and it's been banned a hundred times there. Uh, but when you say so, about you're, things, if, wait, wait, wait. 
but bear with me. Go ahead. When you talk about uh, 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 areas of the dark web, I think for every, like, I'm going to quote Peter Van Valkenburg here, for every use case you don't like, or every use case where it's maybe considered the dark web, let's consider those use cases where actually Bitcoin is helping humanity. I like, I don't understand why you can't, you know, forget the speculators, for, forget all the things you don't like, why you can't even just approach the idea that Bitcoin is actually a really useful tool for people living in authoritarian regimes or living in really troubled circumstances. That permissionless nature that anyone in the world can send Bitcoin to these people and it can help their lives. Isn't that something worth going, hold on, this is useful. We should we should talk about this. Well, you haven't, yeah, I, I agree with you that, and this is somebody who's operating in the banking system and I see firsthand how oppressive governments are. Governments are destroying people's liberty, their privacy, uh, and to the extent that there was a way to circumvent that, there was a way around all the government uh, laws, all the KYC and AML, right? I think that would be good for society. But unfortunately, the government is not going to sit back and allow people to circumvent these rules. They're there for a reason, and they're going to shut down uh, people's ability to get around it. And, and so that would happen very easily with, with Bitcoin. I mean, they can <laughs> impose tremendous penalties for being caught with Bitcoin or using Bitcoin. I mean, and, and then people would, would, would go away from it. I mean, why didn't, honest the, why people, didn't Lukashenko do that then? Because that's hmm? what happened. That's what happened in Belarus. It, people were using Bitcoin to circumvent the government. So why did Lukashenko not do that? Why did he I don't know. How, how, do, how do I know? What, but the was, point being, but, so we have this, we have this network that's helping people around the world. Isn't that worth fighting for, Peter? But I don't, I, I, I don't think that's the right battle. I would want a battle that, yes, we should fight against government tyranny and what they're doing to destroy our privacy and our freedom. But the solution is not going to be Bitcoin because Bitcoin isn't going to work. And a lot of people have put their faith in it. They're going to end up losing a lot of money because eventually the bubble is going to crash. And, and, if, and, and, and if the U.S. government, I tell you this, if the U.S. government thought that a lot of tax revenue was being lost, due to Bitcoin, they would come down on it hard. What if a lot of tax revenue can be made by taxing Bitcoin uh, capital gains, Peter? But let's go back to a common ground. Well, there, there won't be any capital gains then. <laughs> Wrong. Are you 100% certain? No, but are you 100% certain that Bitcoin is going to fall in price, Peter? Because ever since I've listened to you, yes. you've been saying you're 100% certain it's going to fall in price and it's gone nothing but go done nothing but go up. And I'll just throw this saying out. Someone who's wrong 100% of the time is just as valuable as someone who's right 100% of the time, right? All the right, point I'm, is yeah, you so don't know. I'm not wrong 100% of the time by saying that Bitcoin is eventually are you sure going to crash. This? Let's, I've said, let's bet on this. Yes. Then take my bet. Yes. Take my bet. It, you can't bet Why? on it because it gets it gets it gets. It, I I don't know when it's going to crash. It's going to crash eventually. And you know what? I am so I am so sure that Bitcoin is going to crash that I don't own any of it. And you've done horribly. None you've been it. a horrible risk manager so, up until now. Well, I don't care. I, you I, have to. I, I don't That's care. your I, fiduciary I, look, responsibility. Is to be a good no, risk not. manager. I, 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 yes, it is, sir. As a yeah, money yeah. manager, There's it's no, your fiduciary I, I, responsibility to be a good risk manager. And you've done a horrible time. No, and any any fiduci any any fiduciary who gets involved with cryptocurrencies is gonna get sued when they crash. You know, that that I can tell you. There's no way the lawyers are gonna escape that one. And they're going to be like, that was reckless and irresponsible. You shouldn't have bought that. 100% certain. Eh? You know, 100% I mean, certain. No. That's a very dangerous position to be in, Peter. You know that as well as I do. Well, you're 100% sure. No, I'm not. Are you 100% certain? No. It's not going to No, I am not. But I'm not saying. All right. So you're, so you're saying I, I could be right that it goes to zero. Absolutely, you could be right. I'm going to give you, in fact, listen, if you if you give me the chance that it could, if I give you the chance it could go to zero, would you give me the chance it'll go to my price target of $2 million of Bitcoin? Because you have to. Well, look, you have to. You look, have to. Will you give me that? Will you give me that, sir? Look, there's, there, look, there's, there's a chance that anything okay. can happen, right? But I, I don't think that chance is high enough that I want to bet the on it. The market's only saying and it's a 2% chance if, right now. The market's only saying it's a two percent. I don't care what the market is saying. Percent. The market says uh, the, the market says a lot of things that turn out to be wrong. Do you know what? Do you know what? The, one of the one of the, I find one of the biggest distracting parts of this thing sometimes is price. Uh, I, I find like 
I think one of the most difficult things with Bitcoin is the volatility. And I'm with you on this, Peter. It could go up to 150,000. It could crash next year for 30,000. That absolutely is. And that is a risk. I mean, well, it could crash a lot lower than 30,000. Right, but, but I mean, it could. And gold could crash down to $10. Like anything can happen. As no, 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 no. Gold, gold really can't go to $10. Well, because, it can. No, can. because remember, so let's assume gold really started to go down, right? I'm a jeweler. Right? I know I need gold because I make jewelry. If gold gets to a certain point, I'm just going to start loading up on it because I need it. I got to make, if I'm a computer chip manufacturer and I know I need gold, and if gold comes down to a really low price, I'm going to stock up. I'm going to build up my inventory. There's real value. Uh, You know, central banks out there that want more gold. If the price of gold went down, God, I, I can, I can increase my gold reserves. There'd be all this demand. Gold can drop. You know, temporarily it can have it, you know, it can sell off. There could be a computer program, but there's so much real buying. And of course, if gold did go down that low, nobody could mine it. All the gold mines would be out of business, so there wouldn't be any new gold. But it's just, you're, you're not going to see that. I mean, that's never happened to the price of gold going back to the beginning of time. No, you're right. I was wrong there because there's that base industrial use. But I'm, I'm sure I can invent a scenario in the metaverse where no one needs go, go, gold anymore. But, but by the way, huh. but. What I'm the thing I'm trying to get to is like price can itself be kind of distracting and volatility can be kind of distracting. But what I can't, what I find is very difficult to answer against is is the benefits of a uh, of a, a a money like Bitcoin, which is permissionless, which is censorship resistant, which is decentralized, which is out of, uh, 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 of the reach of government control. And and despite what you said about uh, governments can ban it, they have. It's banned in Bolivia, it's banned in Pakistan, it's banned in China. People still use Bitcoin in those countries. I've been to Bolivia and I've met Bitcoiners using Bitcoin in that country despite Well, it, it depends being on the penalties. Look, I mean, people people take drugs in America. A lot of drugs are illegal and they still use them. So a lot of it depends on how big the penalties are uh, for using it. Uh, you know, So if the government really wanted to get serious, if the U.S. government said anybody that gets caught with Bitcoin, it's 10 years in jail, a hundred thousand dollar fine. People aren't going to use it. It's well, too I, the, the the risks are too high. They're just not going to take a chance. I'd be very surprised if that happens in the U.S. Because firstly, I think that's also unconstitutional. Um, well, look, be, a lot uh, they do a lot of things that are unconstitutional. I, they made I, it illegal to own gold, and so if they could do that, they can make it illegal to own Bitcoin. That's for sure. Well, there's a different scenario with that. And they as make well, it but, illegal to own drugs. Or well, bit, they, bit, Bitcoiners are a very wealthy and powerful group now, and that's being seen as their influence in politics as well. But again, it's another conversation. But but I mean, look, Peter, I would be willing to come down to, to uh, Puerto Rico with you without a camera, without a, a podcast, and just sit down and talk to you about these different scenarios of how Bitcoin is being used around the world. Look, the fact that it can improve people's lives or save lives, I think is one of the things that's worth going, like morally, there's a moral reason to just sit down and have a very honest conversation about Bitcoin. And look, you could criticize well, But it can it say, ruin lives too. You you act as if it's a one-way street. Yeah, but, I mean, yeah, it, yeah, but they're, they're, they're two different scenarios. It can ruin lives in terms of an investment, and all investments can do that. People do that on GameStop. They can do that by buying gold leverage. So let's forget the price argument. I'm saying as a technology, it can save lives. As a technology, it is probably saving lives. And as a technology, it's making the lives of people in difficult circumstances better. But the technology like, could work without Bitcoin. Well, tell me how. Please tell me how. Well, again, you, you, take, you take a cryptocurrency that's backed by real money, and it doesn't even have to be gold. It could be some other asset, but it has to be backed by something, and then let all those people transact in that, have a viable store of value that isn't volatile, doesn't swing around, that isn't dependent on somebody else buying it, that isn't a Ponzi scheme. It's, it's, it's called the blockchain. It would be called the blockchain, and Bitcoin is the first and probably the only real use case for a blockchain in it that it is truly decentralized. All these other blockchains which have a component of centralization, you could do it much more efficiently with other databases. But let's go back, Peter McCormick, please. I think we agree on this with Peter Schiff. Sound money is a moral responsibility, correct? We agree with uh, uh, on that. Gold bugs and Bitcoiners all agree that sound money is a moral issue or a moral responsibility in that vein. Yeah, but Bitcoin doesn't qualify. Why? It's the, it's actually a harder money than gold is. It's got a better stock to flow. And by the way, sir, one minute, please. Uh, again, it, it is verifiable, portable, transferable. All the things that gold lacks. It's a better racehorse, okay, as the reason, Paul Tudor Jones says. The reason that... 
the reason that gold is hard, the reason that it's sound, is those are ways to compare it to paper money, which is soft, not hard. And when you drop a bill on the, on the table, it doesn't make a sound. Sound money makes a sound. A gold coin, when you drop it, you hear a sound. That's where the sound money came from. It was the sound that the money made. So you know, Bitcoin doesn't make a sound. It doesn't have any substance. It's softer than paper. It's drop that network. Drop that network on the world, and it will move the world <laughs> off its axis. It is the world's no. strongest no, computer no, system. No, this is this. So what? This is just oh, wow. all Don't part say that. of the, Don't say that. the spiel. So it's part of the cult of Bitcoin to get people into it. You come up with all this nonsense oh, and oh, okay, you know, you know. But when you strip it all down, it's it just a Ponzi. That's what you're talking about. A, a Hold pyramid. On. Hold on. What I would say, actually, uh, Pete, I, Peter, I think there are some uh, there are some valid, valid there are some validity behind the claims that sometimes it can come across as a bit cultish. I do. I sometimes struggle with Bitcoiners with the way arguments are built up. I'm here now in El Salvador. I went to a protest the other day, and this lady was saying to me, "Bitcoin's no use to me. I've got a hundred dollars to live on, uh, and I need to buy food. I can't save." Uh, and she was, you know, very, you know, she she said she just doesn't have any spare money ever. And if she did, it would be a devastating for her to put it into something that in the short term drops. I'm with you. Sometimes we can be cultish about about these things. But to me, that also just comes down to education. And that doesn't mean uh, that Bitcoin can't work for other people. So I'm, I'm with you. I'm absolutely fundamentally with you on, on that point. It can be a bit coldish. But at the same time, to call it a Ponzi scheme is disingenuous because it fails the description of a Ponzi scheme because it's not paying out people. Like it, it, it is a it, it is a zero-sum game. It's not paying out people for yeah, the new money that's coming. So to call it a Ponzi yeah, is disingenuous. It's, it's Ponzi-esque because it's, it's got elements of a Ponzi. It's got elements of a pyramid, of a chain letter. There's all sorts of ways to describe it. But again, since Bitcoin doesn't generate any money, right? There's no, you know, there's no yield on it. And to the extent that I am able to profit from Bitcoin, it's because some new money came in and paid a higher price. And now for that person to profit, another person has to come in and pay an even higher price. So the money that I get out is the money that you put in. That's the Ponzi uh, nature of it, is everybody depends on new money coming in so that existing money can get out, right? A as opposed to a legitimate investment that doesn't need any new money coming in because the investments themselves generate the money. They generate that's, the return. But that's, but that's not entirely true now anymore because a lot of the well, things that people are investing in don't generate a return. They don't well, generate dividends. Th that's true because they're, but they're betting that in the future they will. I, right? But are they really? Because I don't believe they are. I don't believe no, anyone no, these I, days I, I buying agree. stocks. Yeah. So I think, I think that model's broken. Yeah. No, but yes, this is a massive bubble. Central banks, the Fed in particular, but the ECB, all these other central banks, have turned the stock market into a giant casino. There's massive malinvestment, massive bubbles, and Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies are just part of that. In fact, it could be the, the biggest bubble that the central banks have created. The most irrational uh, exuberance of all uh, is concentrated in cryptocurrencies and, you know, now NFTs or whatever you want to, you know, all this stuff is a bunch of nonsense. But I think I think what, what quite an interesting thing I've got to hear is like you, you've obviously admit there's a value in cryptocurrencies in the idea of being able to transfer something around. I think the difference between maybe you and I and Greg is the fact that you want one that's backed by something, whereas we are fine with having something that isn't backed by something. Would you say that's the fundamental difference between our arguments? Well, I, I am perfect. I see the benefits of um, cryptocurrencies backed by real assets uh, and backed by real money like gold. I think that would be great if we had those circulating and if the governments allowed it to happen. But I think the governments would be very threatened by that because if you had uh, a, a, a widely acceptable uh, cryptocurrency backed by gold, Everybody would prefer that to the dollar, to the euro, to the yen. People could price goods and services in it. People could save in it. People can contract in it. Uh, and the governments would hate that. Uh, and yeah. they would want to put any of those companies out of business, uh, you know, because they would be offering a better product uh, than the government. Well, we and, saw that with the uh, with the Facebook currency and uh, Zuckerberg being brought because yeah, and, and he was even he was just going to he was going to back Libra with a basket of currencies. He yeah. wasn't even going to use gold. He, sh if, you know, gold would have been a better backer 
you know, for the for Libra than a basket of currencies. But then they walked that back and they said, okay, we're just going to back the Libra by the dollar and make it into a stable coin, yeah. right, with, but, with dollars. But the point and then they didn't to, even do that. But the point I was trying to get to is, like, you do see some value in the cryptocurrencies because of the ease of exchange. But the fund I'm just trying to isolate the fundamental difference is Greg and I don't believe it needs to be backed some by some, well, we believe it needs to be backed by uh, uh, math. You believe it needs to be backed by a physical uh, a, a physical item such as gold. Am I fair? Well, it, could, it doesn't even have. It could be backed by intangibles. I mean, okay. so I, I I can back. You can back it with anything that has real value. You know, uh, licenses to computer software that generate income, or music, or film libraries. I mean, you can almost tokenize any kind of real asset. Uh, as long as there's some real asset that's backing that token, but it'd be hard to use it as money if it was, unless it was backed by something like gold that's a lot more stable and easier to, you know, value uh, than other types of assets. That's why gold became money in the first place. So I think gold is the ideal store of value to back up any cryptocurrency. But what I'm saying is that's the, I think that's the, that's the fundamental difference is that you believe it should be backed up by something, and I understand that argument, and, yeah. and we and, and we believe it doesn't. But the idea of yeah. this kind of cryptocurrency, at least I feel like there's some common ground there. What I would interject here and then leave you both to comment is that it, this desire for it to be backed by something is entirely personal. That's something you want. That's something Greg doesn't need. That's something I don't need. Backed by math is enough for me. Uh, b being decentralized is enough for me. And if enough people are, are, are on Greg and I's side of the fence, which exists, and less on your side, then you could be wrong in this game. And then it, 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 a Bitcoin could end up becoming the leading currency. So this just comes down to a, a kind of personal preference by what your money is backed by. Well, but, well, first of all, even why, why, why Bitcoin? Why not Ethereum? Or, you know, well, I mean. I mean, that, that's, I mean, there's, that's really, well. That's really uh -huh. easy. To, that's really easy to answer. That's that's a really easy thing to answer. Firstly, Bitcoin is the most decentralized. I mean, it's infinitely more decentralized than Ethereum. Uh, it's also uh, infinitely more secure than Ethereum. I think it has a better base of developers. I think it's the most uh, is the it is the most developed. Uh, I go around the world with this, and I see Bitcoin everywhere. Ether to me is Ethereum is Vegas. Um, and, and so you think people are people who are buying it are making a mistake, and the fact that the price is going up just reflects the fact that they're wrong. No, I think what it is is just a different point of view. Like you and I have a different point of view of Bitcoin v gold, and they have a different point of view, and and this is just a race between those. What I'm putting to you is that all these races are on at the moment. You know, could could you be wrong? Like. Could you be wrong? Could, could can you see a future whereby shit? I got this wrong because people don't care about it being backed by gold. Well, I think they don't care about it now because the price is going up, and I, I, I hear all the arguments about how it's so much better to have it backed by nothing. But I, you know, it's like they made that argument with the dollar when Nixon mm. took us off the gold standard in '71, right? They actually said that a dollar backed by nothing is better than a dollar backed by something. Well, it turned out that that wasn't the case. A dollar backed by gold had much more value than a dollar backed by nothing. Well, and why I is think that? a crypto because is, because once it's, when it's backed by nothing, there's no, there's nothing there. There's well, nothing is, but real. It, but, but is it all? Isn't it down to the supply? Because it's backed by nothing, they can print as much as they want. Well, that's that's a good part of it. And now you're going to yeah. say, well, you know, we 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 can't. Well, they they can't print as much crypto because they're capped at twenty one. But the thing is. Even though they can't make more Bitcoin, they can make other cryptos that are almost identical. In fact, I could make something identical to Bitcoin. I would just call it something else. Who's going to who's going to use it, Peter, though? It's but, about the network. Again, it's about the value of the network. But somebody but so they can build up another network or they can piggyback it on the same network. I mean, what network are all these other cryptos using? I mean, they're all trading. I mean, people are using. No, them. he he means the net like the network effect, a bit like with the telephone. The network effect effect of Bitcoin is the fact that you can go to almost any country in the world now and have Bitcoin liquidity. You don't have that with other cryptocurrencies. Well, but did you so have you that ten years? Did you have that ten years ago? That's why it's less risky now. That's why it's less risky now, Peter. So no, but but somebody else can build up a network or use a network. I mean, I mean, no, nothing is popular forever. It, you know, how do you know it's not a fad and people want something else? Maybe you don't. It, it, in the future, it could be. But but the network effect we saw similar with Betamax versus VHS, right? 
and and in the end, VHS won because of network. Yeah, and in, and and in the end, VHS is gone too. So who cares? Who uses VHS? They're all yeah. gone. Yeah. So and, you know, and in the, it doesn't gold, matter. In the end, gold might only be something that is used for industrial use, and it might be two hundred dollars an ounce. These things. Well, like, I accept I, all of these scenarios. What I'm but wondering that, is that that one is far more remote. Uh, than saying that some new cryptocurrency backed by nothing that didn't even exist over a decade ago is going to be around forever. Yeah, you but, know, that, but, but, you know. <laughs> but, but here we are with it traded in nearly every country in the world with liquidity. People accepting it for payments in pretty much every country in the world. They're not, well, uh, they're I, not I know, really. I know what you're, you're going to say, but it's, a, it's an emerging technology that's developing and growing, just like the internet was. I, I, in fact, I think if you go back to the 2017 bubble, Right, where that peaked out at 20,000. Mm -hmm. I think back then there probably were more merchants that were saying, hey, we'll accept Bitcoin, you know, we're, than, than are today. I, yeah. I, I think that, I think that they, they, it's actually gone down, that it peaked out. And even people make fun of me for pointing this out, but you look at the- I don't uh, disagree. You, you look on the web and you look at Google Trends. When was Bitcoin the most popular? It was in 2017. Fewer people are searching for Bitcoin now. It, it, there, there was, if this thing was going to keep growing and growing to the sky, it, that, it, would, it would be more popular now. More people would be learning about it than in 2017. But that's not the case. I don't, yeah. think, I don't think Google Trends, people searching for the term Bitcoin, is a good, uh, an accurate measure of how popular uh, Bitcoin is. Well, I mean, well, it, well it's how, how many times people are searching for it or search by Bitcoin or Bitcoin or whatever. Can can I bring it back to a credit perspective, Peter McCormick, and and, and talk about course, 30 yeah, years in the credit markets? And while I, and I want to find common ground between the gold bugs and the Bitcoin Bitcoin bugs, uh, Peter Schiff, the the reality is that countries default all the time. In fact, in my career, Argentina has defaulted three times. OK, I got my start. Right. I got my start at the Royal Bank of Canada when we were dealing at the Royal Bank of Canada with a Latin American debt portfolio that if it had been marked to market would have vaporized our book value of equity. Okay. The, essentially the Royal Bank of Canada, Canada's largest financial institution was insolvent in 1988, hence the Brady plan. Now the Brady plan, tre Treasury Secretary Nicholas Brady wasn't designed for the Royal Bank of Canada. It was designed for all the U.S. money center banks that were in exactly the same position, okay? They needed a solution to the five-year loans they had made to lesser developed countries that had defaulted and were trading at 25 cents on the dollar. And Treasury Secretary Nicholas Brady came out with a brilliant plan that switched a five-year loan to a 30-year loan backed by U.S. Treasury zero coupon bonds. Accounting gimmickry did not, did not uh, make make them have to mark their books to market, okay? Preserve their book value of equity. The point is, in a capitalist system that's built on credit, you have tremendous risk that that system can fail at any time. It has in three times in my career. The most recent was the uh, the COVID crisis and printing of money yeah. is the only solution. One, one second, point, please, though. please. The, Look, the, the, it the, is the anti-fiat. Much as gold is the anti-fiat, so is Bitcoin. But it's the anti-fiat for the technology savvy, for the people that are going to embrace this. Now, can they both win? Yes, they can. But in the fact is, over the last 10 years, only one of them has truly lapped the course many, many times, and that's Bitcoin. And what you're saying is it can't continue, and I'm saying it can. Because of this first of credit. All, okay, wait, wait, first of all, the, the Brady bonds and all of that, none of that is capitalism. I mean, sure, it, capitalism is going to have successes and it's going to have failures. But those type of massive failures, you know, are not the fault of capitalism. They're the fault of Correct. government and government intervention in capitalism. Socializing losses. Not allowing capitalism to function. Right, so, so it's not that capitalism is prone to failure. It's government that is prone to failure. Capitalism is prone to success. But certainly, there's always going to be people failing. That's the beauty of capitalism. And it's the fear of failure that keeps people honest and keeps people from taking excessive risks. Uh, but so I, you know, I agree with all that, that, that stuff. But I, I think that the people who are choosing Bitcoin, you know, I think they're making a mistake to think that it's, you know, is it an alternative uh, to dollars? I guess, it, but it's not a viable alternative. It's not a better alternative. I think it's like getting from the going from the frying pan into the fire. I still think 
you, you've got fiat, except you're giving up some of the main benefits of fiat. The only thing you have, in theory, is a limited supply. But supply means nothing if you don't know what demand is. And if there's no demand, even one Bitcoin is too many. So 21 million, I mean, that's way too many if nobody wants them. And, and so I don't want to gamble that there will be demand for Bitcoin in the future. I don't think there will okay. be. Now, well, at you know, what I mean, point? Do so you, I, I, w- I would rather own other things. I'd rather own other assets. Do you, at what point do you, will you, will you ever admit you were wrong then, Peter Schiff? Like, because at what point well, do you admit you're wrong if, like, God forbid we all die and you're going to die someday on your deathbed. Will you ever admit that you were wrong on Bitcoin because, you know, it is now 10 times higher in, in the future than it is today. I certainly, I certainly hope that on my deathbed, I'm not talking about Bitcoin. Uh, I'm (laughs) Um, betting you will be only because I love your style. Okay. But at the end of the day, sir, you, um, okay, go ahead. But here's what I, here's what I would have to see in order for me to say, crap, I guess I was wrong. Right is that Bitcoin has to actually replace fiat currencies and it has to be used right, as money in an economy. Meaning, you go out and rent an apartment. The landlord wants Bitcoin. The rent is in Bitcoin. It is expressed in Satoshis per month. And you pay your rent in Satoshis. The landlord takes those Satoshis and pays his property taxes, pays his mortgage, pays his electrical bills because he borrowed Satoshis. He has a mortgage that has, it's in Satoshis. You go out and buy insurance for your house. You bought, you, your premium is in Satoshis. Your death benefit, your, your benefits are everything. We're actually using Satoshis. You go to the store, Satoshis are the price, right? So nobody ever actually has to sell the Satoshi, it's actually accepted as a medium of exchange, as a unit of account, as a store of value. It proliferates as money at some stable price, right, where you now have a stable relationship between Bitcoin and everything else, right? Every other commodity, everything else that you buy with Bitcoin. If if we develop a world where Bitcoin is actually money, um, whatever the, you know, the, I mean, the dollar value at that point will be irrelevant because there won't be dollars anymore. Right there, we won't use dot. We won't use euros. Everybody will just be using Bitcoin, <laughs> and all these other cryptos will be gone too. Wouldn't you argue other, that that's a other... process, though, Peter? Wouldn't you argue it's a process, and we're progressing on that path? I right don't see. Now? I don't see that we're any closer to that now okay. than we were ten years ago. I think you need I to see open your no eyes. Pro- then. No, all we all it is is more gambling, more speculating. That's all. It, it's all pie in the sky. So, Peter, I, I mean, I, I don't understand gold particularly well. I don't look at it too much, but I understand some basics. And I think if I tried to explain it, you would have to correct me. And I think that's similar with gold, because uh, Bitcoin in, in, the, in reverse, in that uh, you certainly talk about that more than I talk about gold. But I think there's some things that maybe you don't see or understand. Like, this is my job. I do this all day and every day. And we're certainly... Uh, moving forward, we you know, where are we compared to we were four years ago? Okay, we have a more developed derivatives market, which provides better liquidity. We also have a country with it becoming legal tender. Uh, we have services which allow people to spend Bitcoin. We have things that now start starting to be priced in Bitcoin, but limited. The problem with the unique account argument, I would say, is, and I hope you'll understand this, is that it is a currency which fluctuates against every other currency in the world because it's a global currency. Well, so, it, so does every currency. Every currency fluctuates uh, against every other cool. currency. Yeah, but this is a global currency, whereas the others aren't global currencies. They're sovereign currencies. And on that basis, Bill Miller, Bill Miller, famous, famous U.S. investor, he says, look, volatility is the price of return. If you have something that isn't volatile, chances are the return on that is going to be very low. Bill Miller, yes, embraces Bitcoin, but he also... Yes, but volatility doesn't guarantee return. Just because something is volatile doesn't mean it's going to go 100%, up. 100%. But it can just go down. Something and that people goes, can make money there. Uh, correct. But look, it's, it's yeah, volatility you can make money is the Bitcoin, price sure. of return. Uh, when are you going to do that, though? You, you can't just talk that big game. If you're going to say you're going to short it, you got to do it. No, because I that's what I makes gonna. a market. I said you could make money shorting it. Look, I'm not shorting a lot of things that I think are overpriced. Okay. I'm not short any stocks right now either. That's fair. I would, I'm I just think... short. I'm basically short the dollar by Beautiful. being long so are we. real assets. And so are we. Well, you think you are. You think you are. Uh, I, you know, you I, know. <laughs> that's fair. Look, at 
we're team anti fiat. We are team anti fiat. And as Lawrence Le right. Leppard says, I'm going to borrow this from Lawrence Leppard. If the gold bugs and the Bitcoiners ever got on the same page, which I think is going to happen, we're all on team anti fiat. And you don't put all your money on one resource, as Paul Tudor Jones says. You own a bit of gold, you own a bit of Bitcoin. You because are hedging Paul against Tudor the Jones, fiat. Yeah, Paul Tudor Jones is buying Bitcoin like he would bet on a racehorse, right? He thinks that it might make a move up. Paul Tudor Jones is not one of these hodlers that's going to hold Bitcoin forever. He will sell it. He's buying Bitcoin as a trade. And when he thinks the trade is over, he'll get out. Uh, you know, so he's not in it because he wants to marry Bitcoin. He's dating it because he thinks he'll have a good time. What would you, why do you say, every, every gold bug says you have to have at least 10% of your portfolio in gold. What do you put your other 90% in? I mean, you guys got to exactly. get some real I conviction. Well, get some I real conviction. I told you, I invested, it's mostly in stocks. I own stocks and real estate. That's what I own. Greg, Peter made a good point there because there are there are a number of people who invested in Bitcoin this year who did exit uh, near the kind of plus 55 to 64 range. A lot of people did. There was the, I can't remember the name of the company, but the gold company in the UK who bought a bunch of Bitcoin and exited it. The point, the point I want to make though, Peter, is that that's that's that scenario. There are also other people around the world who buy Bitcoin and hold onto it as a as an insurance against their local currency, and and will and will never get rid of it. Yeah. So there's a range. Well, of I just people. think, look, sometimes you have an insurance policy, and the company that underwrote it goes bankrupt, and your insurance is worthless. Yeah, I, I think if you, could be if right. you own go, if you own Bitcoin as an insurance, you better have some insurance for your insurance. Maybe that's where gold comes in. Maybe. Right? Maybe if you own Bitcoin, you better own some gold to insure your Bitcoin. I would not argue with that. I would not argue. But the beautiful thing about Bitcoin is there actually is no counterparty risk. That's why the decentralization no, there is, is. What is there? You, you, what is depend, that? you depend on a counterparty to want to buy it. It's all about the counterparty. It's, you that need is a counterparty to sell the, it. You know what counterparty risk is defined as? Yes, you know, I know yes, what it So means. you're taking it out of context. That is not the counterparty. That's a market risk, Peter. That's not a counterparty right. risk. Yeah, well, the, 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 you, need, you, need a, you need a new buyer. I, th I, th I think one of the difficulties... And a lot of people, excuse me, though, a lot mm -hmm. of people own Bitcoin through an ETF. There's a counterparty. There are exchange-traded funds. Look at Grayscale. All these, in fact, I hear all these Bitcoin people saying we need more ETFs to make it easier to buy Bitcoin because it's so hard to buy, it's so cumbersome, it's so risky, it's so expensive. We need these ETFs so that more people could buy it, which you know undermines the whole argument of buying Bitcoin in the first well, place. Well, here, here's a neat thing. Here's a neat thing. Do you still have a Bitcoin wallet, Peter Schiff, or did, did have you given up I on that? I, I, I have this one Bitcoin wallet that I have no ability to access because I don't Would you get another password. one? Would you get another one? For me. Would you do that well, for, for me? I have, I have, so I, I can well, I send no you Bitcoin some. So I can it. send you some and then you can give send it to them, Spencer. You can send them to my kid. No, I've already Although had. You say. I already have. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But here's the funny Pete, thing. Peter, you need it more than Spencer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't need it. I don't think but he But the problem it. is he's not going to do anything with them. He's just going to hold on to them until they're worthless. Oh, uh, this is so different. <laughs> but th this is a different in uh, in cultural evaluation. But look, but the mark of a great risk manager, Peter, and I'm gonna t I'm gonna dial back my my uh, uh, Peter Schiff. I'm gonna dial back my criticism on you. You have actually admitted that you will change your tune if, and you laid out a bunch of scenarios that would have to happen. I'm arguing that it's in the process of happening. But the mark of a great risk manager, as you know, is to change their investment position when the facts change. And you basically admitted to me that there is a point at which you will change your investment position. It may be yeah, so if, far if in the future. Yeah, if, okay. if that happens, kudos something to you, I sir. I kudos, don't expect kudos. to happen. Okay, good. But, but no one happens, is certain. I'd no one is certain. You have to admit that the world is a probability distribution, and there's tail risks on all sorts of sides. Um, hey, uh, Peter Sh McCormick, I'm I'm happy that Peter Schiff admitted there is a scenario in which he will change his investment policy. Is there one where you would change yours? Is there one where you were hundred percent Bitcoin? And oh said, yeah, yeah, hundred percent. What would have to happen? Well, first of all, I would lose my conviction that fiat is the Ponzi. And I'm never going to lose that because it's 100% mathematically okay. certain that fiat will continue to debase. We have right, reached the point. forget about fiat. Why? That's how what? everyone values the unit of the world is valued in fiat. No, I'm saying what, what could happen to Bitcoin itself that would make you change your mind about Bitcoin? 
Imagine that the blockchain does fail. Imagine that it get, gets hacked. I don't believe it will happen, but you know there is a minuscule chance. Imagine, for example, that quantum computing hacks the Bitcoin blockchain. I think we'd have a huge other problems in the world, like every single other system that's based on SHA-256 encryption will be hacked before Bitcoin is. But yeah, look, it could happen. What about price? Is there any, is there anything on price, or does it, is that irrelevant? I think I think the price one's a tricky one because uh, if it hits certain price points, people will be piling and 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 buying it. There's enough uh, Bitcoiners out there, enough liquidity. But uh, it's a it's a fair point. Look, if Bitcoin went under ten thousand and was sustained and uh, it was you know and 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 stopped performing in the cycles it did, my conviction would drop. I think my my I think there's a difference between fear and conviction. I also think if there was a coordinated global uh, regulatory effort to limit Bitcoin, that would be something that would change my conviction. It wouldn't change my desire to work on Bitcoin, but it would change uh, my conviction on it as and well. And I think that might but make it more valuable, Peter McCormick, in that scenario. But who well, knows? yeah, potentially. But I think we, we, we're in one of these typical Peter Schiff versus someone debate where we're, we're recycling the same arguments. Every Everyone's heard these all before, and you know, it's, it's tough to convince Peter of, of something else, and we don't need to replay them. But what I want to do is focus on the common ground. I mean, the common ground, which I think is progress, is the fact that you at least see the value of a, a, a something which you can transfer permissionless censorship resistance you see uh, you we have common ground in wanting subvert the government we have common ground in uh, uh um See, feared as a Ponzi scheme. I think that we just the general difference is, is what this cryptocurrency would be backed by. You know, we're happy with math, and you're happy with uh, uh, you, your preference is something like gold, but a tangible yeah. asset. And, and another, an interesting point too is a lot of people in Bitcoin are trying to cozy up to the regulators because they're trying to get Bitcoin more interjected into the mainstream uh, investors. They're trying to play down. The fact that Bitcoin is a threat to the dollar. They're trying to say, oh, no, no, it's not a threat to the dollar. They're saying, oh, Bitcoin will help strengthen the dollar. I mean, all this nonsense, right? That's They're blowing Saylor, all this smoke. Huh? That's, what, that's what Michael Saylor said. You're Michael, yeah, yeah, Michael Saylor and several other guys, mm. you know, that, that, that are trying to get, you know, portfolio managers to buy, right? Trying to get the institutional money to come in and trying to get the regulators to bless it. They're basically trying to dial back all that by saying, hey, it's just another asset. You know, it's going to make the dollar even more valuable, even more popular because, you know, you're embracing crypto. I mean, they're trying to basically take everything Bitcoin was supposed to be and basically say, oh, no, it's nothing like that. It's this brand new thing. And, and they're reinventing it to kind of create the appeal because what their real concern is, their real motivation is they just want more buying. They want the price to go up and they it's want the institutional money to drive it up. What I want to put in there is that not actually not all Bitcoiners are, are equal. Not, not everyone thinks that. It's probably not all gold bugs are equal. Some gold bugs are pro Bitcoin. Uh, you know, a lot of the work I'm seeing down down in El Salvador isn't people who who want to cozy up the regulators to get more institutional investors in. I understand Saylor does. Yeah, he's put himself under a lot of pressure with the amount he's bought. But not everyone agrees with him. And you know, a lot of people down here actually just want to bring money to a country which brings a certain amount of freedom that they don't have because of the infrastructure down in El Salvador. I'd love to bring you down here and let you see. It, like see it firsthand what, what's being done i mean on the remittance well, i know part. i mean i could hop well look i could hop on brock's plane and fly down with him in fact i, I know they're 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 planning this big uh drone show they were you know we were we were watching brock, the um brock pierce uh, isn't a bitcoiner the, let's just forget brock pierce <laughs> well, he's, he, well he's, he's an, into everything but he's, he's into bitcoin he yeah, just fuck. you know yeah, fuck he's that got guy. other he's into other cryptos <laughs> Yeah, fuck that guy. But, um, uh, but, but, but he's going to be down there in El Salvador. So. And no one gives a shit. But um, <laughs> sorry, I'm just not a fan of the guy. Uh, but what what I would say is that there's lots of stuff being done here that does make lives a bit better. I, I, let's go on the, and we'll bring up the remittance point. I know you said it's only $5 to use um, uh, uh, Western, Western Union, Union. But, but, it's, but it's $0 to use Strike. And you also don't have to go to Western Union. You can be sat on your couch and receive but it. Can and you, but, can you, but can you transfer dollars via Strike or do you so, have to so use Bitcoin? The, the great thing on Strike, you can, set, you can transfer Bitcoin or you can transfer dollars. But then why on, not just transfer dollars? Problem solved. Well, some people do, but they do it on the, the there isn't a international Venmo available now, which does uh, uh, instant, uh, a near free or free settlement of dollars across the US border from El Salvador and families to people who, who live in El Salvador. So they do have this new innovation where they can send a dollar 
and that person can go to the shop and spend that dollar and there's no fee and they don't have to yeah, go to well, Western Yeah, well, I think that's good, but what does that have great? to do with Bitcoin? Because it's built on the big, it's, that exists All on right, the Bitcoin All right, it's on the network. Bitcoin network, but yeah. it's not Bitcoin. They don't need to make Bitcoin legal tender. They can keep using dollars. <laughs> yeah, but some people choose to hold some of it in Bitcoin. So that you've got that, you've got that optionality of both. Yeah, they, they'd be better off if they held it in, you know, in gold or something else. How can you say that with 100% certainty? You cannot say that with 100% certainty, Peter. You know that. Well, over a long t- over a long time period, yes, I can. No, you I'm cannot a, I'm because since I could be wrong, but I'm 100% certain. I love you. I could be wrong, but I'm 100% certain. That's yeah, not a I'm risk manager. That is someone who is Look, stubborn. I'm pretty certain that I'm certain that the earth is not going to be invaded by aliens during my lifetime, but I could be wrong. I mean, I think I think didn't we see the videos <laughs> that they already have? Okay, listen, to save us going round and round in circles, uh, I think I actually think this was progress. And I do too. Th- I, think, I think the reason, <laughs> P- Peter Schiff, that people care about this is, is that sometimes I think when you debate uh, Bitcoin, you say things that just factually aren't true. But I also, I'm willing to admit, you get things right that Bitcoiners won't admit. I also think you make really valid points because I see it here on the ground. But I, I would just hope that, I'm going to give you both closing remarks. This wasn't so much a, a moderated debate. It was me and Greg <laughs> versus you. But but I would just ask you to, like personally, just spend a bit of time looking into the, the, the some of the human rights aspects of Bitcoin, some of the freedoms that it brings people in the world. Because I think there's enough value in that and that that is the thing that gives Bitcoin a lot of value. And uh, I'm going to give you both a, a chance to close out. Greg, I'll let you go first because Peter went last time. Okay. Well, thank you for having us. And Peter Schiff, I have to say it's a, it's actually been a pleasure to speak to you in person. Uh, you have measured responses. You are a, a risk manager that views the, the upside or the asymmetric return in Bitcoin as being infinitesimally small, but you don't say that it's zero. So on that basis, I'll give you kudos. Thanks for having me as a guest. I want to just throw out uh, seven people in our business. And I say our business, it's my former business, but Peter Schiff's business of managing money that have embraced Bitcoin. And I think that this is valuable. Um, You know, Paul Tudor Jones, Stan Druckenmiller are well known. One that's not as well known is a gentleman by the name of Steve Tannenbaum, who runs a $45 billion credit focused hedge fund called Golden Tree. And Steve Tannenbaum, who is incidentally probably the smartest guy I've ever met in the credit markets, he has embraced Bitcoin as a percentage allocation in his credit portfolio. And then I talked about, so those are hedge fund guys, um, asset management guys, Paul, uh, excuse me, uh, Bill Miller and uh, Tim Draper. Okay. Uh, very famous. They they view Bitcoin as uh, having a, a place in a diversified investment portfolio. And then gold bugs, Peter. This is important because these are guys in your backyard. Lawrence Leppard, I've already mentioned, but Luke Groman uh, was on a panel with him down in uh, in uh, Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, a couple of weeks ago. Very impressive guy. Talks the same language as you do in terms of fiat being broken. In terms of things like uh, social. Uh, you know, creative destruction not being uh, available in true capitalism anymore. And it's more like socialized losses when you talk about Brady plan and you talk about uh, the the long-term capital management. So those are traditional asset managers, hedge fund guys, gold guys. And then you have the Michael Saylors and you have the Jack Dorseys, the guys that are visionaries from a technical technological side. And all I would say is for people listening Uh, Thanks for listening up until this point. Um, I always view everything as being a probability distribution, and I still view Bitcoin as being the best asymmetric return opportunity I've seen in 32 years of managing risk. That doesn't mean I don't own gold, okay? I own some gold as well, and I own other hard assets like real estate and equities. I do not own any bonds. Bonds are the most foolish fiat contract I have ever seen in my last 30 years. And that's why, because rates are administered, administered rates are being manipulated lower and you are not being paid for the credit risk nor the interest rate risk that you are incurring by owning a bond. So people that own bonds out there, those are the people that should be considering an allocation to Bitcoin if you have no Bitcoin. And if you have no gold as well, but you own bonds, You better do some math because you have failed grade 11 math if you still own your bonds 
in this scenario. So thanks for having me, Peter Schiff. Uh, I, I look forward to talking to you again. Thanks, Greg. And Peter? Yeah, I agree with you. I certainly agree with you on bonds. They are a massive bubble. They are return-free risk. And uh, they're probably the worst asset class that people could be in. Uh, certainly U.S. I mean, um, so to the extent you're going to be in bonds, you, you know, you got to find some of the emerging market currencies, shorter durations. Uh, but yeah, I prefer equities. Uh, and, you know, equities will actually benefit from inflation because they've borrowed money and they get to screw the bondholders when they pay them back in, in cheaper money. And they have, uh, they have real, real assets there. So that's one uh, area where we can we can agree, and you know I also agree that I want the world to be freer. I want less government. I want you know want more prosperity. I just don't think that you have to introduce Bitcoin to achieve that. I think it's unfortunate that all the effort and all the energy that is being spent on Bitcoin and promoting Bitcoin, I would much rather see that be used to promote legitimate hard money, which would be gold, which would be a viable alternative to the fiat system we have now. Let's return to a system that's worked in the past, uh, not one that's probably gonna fail in, in the future. And yeah, you know, you can point to a handful of people, some of them very smart, very wealthy people who have embraced Bitcoin. I mean, I can point to an even larger number of smart people who have stayed away from it for the same reasons that that I have. And the thing with a lot of these guys that are behind Bitcoin, again, we don't really know what their motivation is, what their agenda is, because once you buy Bitcoin, you you got to talk it up. I mean, that's almost like, okay, I buy it. Now I got to tell everybody how great it is uh, and how much I love it and how I'm never going to sell because they want the price to go up. Uh, a lot of these guys could be pumping it for a future dump. You don't really know what their real agenda is. They could just be trading Bitcoin, right? They've embraced it because they think they can sell it to a greater fool. And maybe they're not a fool because they're convinced that there's fools out there that will pay a higher price and they will do what they can to help generate the interest that may uh, you know, help produce that. So I don't know, maybe half the people are, really believe it and they're in it, you know, you know, for the right reasons, as you might want to say. And maybe the other half are just there because they think they can make a quick buck and go right back to fiat. Uh, but, I, you know, just because you have some people that are in it, you know, uh, there were smart people that did a lot of foolish things uh, during the dot-com bubble. They did a lot of foolish things during the housing bubble. And there are p smart people doing f foolish things uh, during the crypto bubble. Some of those people will make money. Some of them have made money. But at the end of the day, it's the people who don't sell that are going to be the bag holders, right? They're going to end, their losses are going to equal the early people's gains, right? It's, it's, it's as, in fact, it's a negative sum game because of all the, the costs involved in, in all the trading. Uh, but it's the people that get out that are going to make the money, not the people that are stuck holding, right? They're just the bag holders. They've lost money. It's a huge transfer of wealth from the people who buy Bitcoin to the people who sell it. Well, listen, appreciate you both coming on. I think uh, I think we made some progress today. I think we're closer than we think on many subjects and uh, even on the subject of Bitcoin. Uh, I think you make some very valid points with regards to Bitcoin as Peter. Uh, I, I sometimes cheerlead it myself and find the need to step back and be a bit more objective. Mm. I just released a show with Lynn Alden today where we looked at criticisms and I think that's uh, some valid work. Uh, love you both. Really appreciated this. I think this All was right. awesome. And, Went longer uh, than I thought. Well, yeah, me too. I, I thought we'd do an hour, but like, uh, I think people will really enjoy this, and uh, I look forward to doing it again in the future. Uh, peace out to both of you. All right. Take care, everybody. Thank uh, you. I'll see you Thank in Puerto you, Rico. Peters. Thank you, well, Peters. No, that's, Look that me up when you get here. I will hit you up. <laughs>